This episode of Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point is sponsored by Blue Bridge Games. For the games and gifts you won't find anywhere else, head to Grand Rapids, Michigan's friendliest local game store, Blue Bridge Games. Blue Bridge Games carries an extensive line of board games, card games, role-playing tabletop games, Magic the Gathering, and more. Stop into their storefront on East Fulton or shop with them online at bluebridgegames.com. You say you want to watch a drama. You say you want to watch a comedy. Well, you can watch it with your mama. Or you can watch it with your daddy. You'll even sit and watch it with your middle. Potatoes unite. Whoa, whoa, Potatoes Unite. Whoa, whoa, Potatoes Unite. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite Exclamation Point, which is based on a blog of the same name, because the truth is our name, and our name is the truth. I was feeling like it was opposite day to day, no matter how big or little. Ah, my name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like for at Couch Potatoes Unite. We're all about the wonders and the unique long form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays. And as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the website or podcast via iTunes iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Amazon Music, basically wherever you get your podcasts to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including but not limited to Stranger Things, iZombie, The Good Place, Game of Thrones, Grace and Frankie, Mr. Robot, Altered Carbon, The Orville, Outlander, Westworld, Fuller House, Schitt's Creek, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Crown, Better Call Saul, plus new episodes are in the works, including revisits for The Hundred, Supernatural, this is us charmed riverdale the american horror story franchise series panel new name we'll talk about season one of american horror stories the dctu series will talk season four of black lightning and the star trek 50 plus series will discuss season one of deep space nine we'll be launching new panels covering call the midwife the animaniacs killing eve brooklyn 99 american gods gray's anatomy cobra kai peaky blinders the marvelous mrs Maisel, a discovery of witches and the hauntings of hill house and blind manor and because we look back at shows now past we'll travel through time and experience all sorts of identities with quantum leap we'll cry bazinga for big bang theory we'll dive deep into the fantasy world of the magicians we'll navigate the witty political satire of parks and recreation we'll become psychos for psych we'll go where everybody knows your name with cheers we hope you'll be listening when we talk about fraser and we'll know that's what she said when we talk about the office both from the uk and the usa by the way did you know that cpu also from time to time goes live we've been live from bunkers comedy shows comic cons and game stores plus we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff including in whatever we're calling these times so make sure you like or follow us at our facebook page our twitter at cpu podcast our instagram at couch potatoes unite or subscribe to our website youtube channel apple itunes channel stitcher radio channel or find us on google podcast spotify Castbox, iheart radio and amazon music in the meantime, if you don't hear a show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews, and we always seek new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of the outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback. Verbal, non-physically violent, and truthful feedback. You don't have to keep secrets or tell us lies. We just ask that you be nice, please. Today, we are around the water cooler and continuing our Catching Up series in which we discuss a sudsy dark comedy drama based on a novel of the same name that airs, or at least aired, on HBO. The show is Big Little Lies, and this is the second of a two-part miniseries in which CPU catches up on this drama. In this episode, part two of this miniseries, we're discussing season two, which aired on HBO from June 9th, 2019 to July 21st, 2019, with a total of seven episodes. As a reminder, created and written by David E. Kelly and originally billed as a miniseries, Big Little Lies stars Reese Witherspoon, Nicole Kidman, Shailene Woodley, Laura Dern, and Zoe Kravitz as five women in Monterey, California, who become embroiled in a murder investigation. 
Alexander Skarsgård, Adam Scott, James Tupper, and Jeffrey Nordling also feature in supporting roles. Meryl Streep joins the main cast in season two. Big Little Lies is a show that was requested for discussion and beloved by some of our resident couch potatoes, namely Hillary, Eddie, Callie, Julianne, and Anna Laura, all of whom have reconvened around the water cooler today, ready to tell no lies, big or little, about Big Little Lies. As always, it should be noted that all of our panelists have watched all episodes of this series, at this point this is true, and may discuss sensitive plot points. So for those of you who have not watched Big Little Lies and plan to do so at some point, listen at your own risk, as there may be major spoilers. Welcome back, panel! How are you? Awesome! Are you ready to tell the truth about season two of these big little lies? Yes. yes. Sure. Whole truth. Sure. Nothing but the truth. <laughs> exactly, just like you said it. Okay, great! <laughs> I don't know what this means, but what I can tell you is that because we're doing a catching up miniseries, I am going to ask you to rate your interest in the show after season two along the standard CPU character question that changes with each show we do. And I did tweak the character question a smidge, a tiny bit. There's a few extra characters, and then we had some character changes, and then maybe a death spoiler or two. So I have a new character question. I'm going to have you rate your interest in season two along, and it goes like this. After season two, would you say you love this show? You love all of the suburban housewife antics and shenanigans, if for no other reason than it distracts you from your own complicated and somewhat unhappy life, like Madeline Martha McKenzie. Do you care about about this show deeply, particularly the strong female characters at the forefront of the cast, you identify with the quiet desperation of keeping up a bold face to hide much darker secrets and lies from others, and even from yourself, like Celeste Wright. Do you enjoy this show well enough, but think it needs to take bolder risks to further amplify the story it's telling? It still feels too subtle, and seeds being planted take a long time to blossom, like Jane Chapman. Do you think this series offers some great potential for mystery and for interesting relationship dynamics? You're willing to go with the flow with all of it, at least until you find yourself forced to fight for what you love, or against what you hate, about it like Bonnie Howard Carlson. Have you grown to like this show more than you did in season one? It offers a great portrayal of the complexity of women's lives, particularly in examining how women treat, support, or denigrate each other, which you think was better depicted in the second season, like Renata Klein. Do you have no real interest in this show? You find that the main characters seem devoid of love and interest in their fellow humans, and or you are oblivious to some of the larger subtexts of this complex drama, like Ed McKenzie. Do you care very little for this show? You think that the main character is a real piece of work and you'd rather move on with your new life and your new wife or spouse like Nathan Carlson? Do you sort of hate this show? Though you love the main characters, particularly Madeline, you'd rather live your own life, watch something else, and definitely not go to college like Abigail Carlson. Do you only watch this show because your spouse watches it and she, he, or they are clearly running the household? like Gordon Klein. Do you watch this show because your parents watch it and won't let you watch TV when they do? You don't really understand what's going on anyway, like Ziggy Chapman. Do you dislike this show strongly because you feel that it was being unfair to the Perry character, too sympathetic to the Celeste character, and not wary enough of anyone else when everyone should clearly be under suspicion for the nefarious goings-on that occur, though that new character played by Meryl Streep is fairly riveting, like Mary Louise Wright. Or you stopped watching this show because you realized that you were unhealthily obsessed with it and its characters, particularly with Celeste, and found yourself taking out your aggression in entirely bad ways to express your passion for it. Or because you, spoiler, died in the season one finale like Perry Wright. Who would like to start amidst this torrential rain that is apparently happening right now? in my neck of the woods. <laughs> it is. The rain is just, it's like everywhere. But hi, I'm Callie. Hi, Callie. Hi. And I am a Madeline and Bonnie. I notoriously take two. So I'm an, a Madeline and Bonnie this time, which is a little bit different from my last time. Yes, last time you were Madeline and Celeste. Mm-hmm. So what different. brings about the change? I don't know. I just like the the Bonnie character intriguing of what is happening in investigations and her relationships, especially with her parents and all of that, I like. So I think that is the change for me. 
All right, welcome back, Callie. Callie, you went first. Would you like to do the dynamics of the panel? Oh, sure. I am Kylie and Hillary's sister-in-law, so I'm married to their brother. Who will never and appear on a podcast. <laughs> no. That would be some funny shit if he did. It really would. Be. He just doesn't, he's not a big public speaker. <laughs> But his opinions are hilarious, and that is the true loss. Okay. That's fair, so, Callie. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> so she segued me, so I'm going to go. And I am Hillary, of whom she just spoke. Hi, Hillary, of whom she just spoke. And I also notoriously have a hard time picking just one character. I often feel many of the descriptions apply, or at least a couple. I'm going to say that mine hasn't really changed from the first one. I'm still Madeline. I actually, I know a lot of people feel that the second season maybe necessarily isn't as strong as the first season, but I still really enjoyed it, which I'll get into, and I would still say that I really love the show. And then I'm still going to say I'm Celeste because the reason that I still really love it is because of these female characters and some of the... There are some high points that are just so perfect because of the female characters that I just still have to say that I love it. So we'll talk about that more. All but right. Mine hasn't really changed. Fair enough. Welcome back, Hillary, my sister. Hi, I'm Julianne. Hi, Julianne. So I, this time around, I'm also choosing two. I chose two last time. I chose Madeline and Celeste, but this time I think I'm more Celeste and Bonnie. I think probably for the reasons that Callie said with Bonnie, like I enjoyed following her story this season. I enjoyed seeing her interact with her parents. You get a lot more introspective into her character in this season. So I really appreciate that. But also like, I I love the strong female characters at the center of the story and enjoy like watching their interactions and how they play off of each other. Fair enough. Welcome back, Julianne. Thanks. I'll go next. Okay. Hi, I'm Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Hello. Mine has not changed. I believe I was Jane and Bonnie last time and it stayed the same for me. I will agree with Hillary that I did not like season two as much as I liked season one. However, I think the concepts for the sh- that the show had were very good. I just felt like they could have been better and I feel like season two, they didn't really know how to wrap it up because the story was already wrapped up, but I feel like we'll get there and we'll talk about that. So Fair enough. Welcome back, Eddie. Hey. Hello. I'm Anna Laura. Hi, I Anna Laura. With- Hello. <laughs> yes. I agree with Eddie. I would I think I would class myself as a Jane and a Bonnie. I can't remember what I was last time. You were Madeline oh. and Celeste last time. Oh. Really switching it up. Mm-hmm, Ooh. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Yeah, because like with season two, I still liked the show. It's still good, and I think they definitely did some really interesting things for season two that I enjoy watching, but I I do agree that season two isn't quite as good as season one, and I also don't really like the ending of season two, especially when season one just had, like, the perfect, perfect ending. All right. Welcome back, Anna Laura. (laughs) She's meditating on that response a little bit. (laughs) I'll elaborate later. Fair enough. And of course, my name is Kylie, and I both participate and moderate this panel, which is often the case. Last time, I was Celeste with a dash of Jane. I think I'm going to be Jane and Bonnie this time. I agree that I liked season two a little bit less than season one. I liked Eddie's remark. I think the concepts were pretty good in season two. We're going to talk about Meryl Streep, and that woman can do no wrong in my eyes. Long have I idolized her. Same. Yes. <laughs> but I I also agree with Anna. I think you like the, the world, yeah. Yes. But I also agree with <laughs> Anna Laura's observation that in some ways season one had the perfect ending, whereas season two, which was not based on a source novel but was entirely of the scriptwriter's making, 
didn't land in a place that felt as satisfying as the end of the first season. And so we're going to talk about that. We're here to talk about season two of Big Little Lies. Big Little Lies, which has not been canceled or renewed by HBO. There's a lot of talk and rumor about them wanting to make a third season, but they have a bunch of movie stars in this cast, so I don't know how that's going to happen. We'll talk about that. But before we get there, we're going to talk about season two, which basically had two major plot lines. The first major plot line was that the five women at the head of the cast basically had a pact where they were not going to share what happened with law enforcement or anyone else as to Perry Wright's death at the end of the first season, which of course was facilitated in the end, really, by Bonnie, with the other four being the accessories to that situation. The second plot line is that Mary Louise Wright, who is Perry's mom, played by Meryl Streep, moves into the Wright household with grieving Celeste, who is still grieving, even though Perry was kind of, you know, an abusive dude, and trying to raise the twin boys that they had together. And so she comes in and starts getting to be very suspicious about everything and all related to Perry's death. She doesn't believe that it was just a fall down some steps. She's not wrong, but she goes about some very interesting investigations into her daughter-in-law and her daughter-in-law's friends. So that is the main subject of season two. Tell me. What did you like? What didn't you like? I loved Meryl Streep. There we go. Let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah, let's just talk about let's this. Just, like, wow. it's like, wow. let's, just, <laughs> let's just get that out of the way. She did great. I loved her. She was the worst mother-in-law in the world. Absolute but, nightmare. But we all also, hated her, right? We all hated I, her. I mean, the level to hate That's her. the point. I mean, we we were supposed to. Yeah, I mean, the level... For real. The she level of her. discomfort. I mean, the best adjective for me, and I know, that, yes, like Eddie was just saying, totally purposeful. But everything she did, her, like, her facial expressions, the way she emoted, like, it was just unsettling. Mm -hmm. I agree. It That's made you hate her. And you're supposed to hate her. She did mm -hmm. her job. But I feel like she hated Celeste before, like, of they course. even got married. Of she course. had a huge chip on her shoulder. And, like, 100%. It, in her, I feel like in her, like, she just wanted Celeste to be like, I killed him. And then she would have been like, I told you. Like, I yeah. don't think that's what she was waiting for the whole time. Mm -hmm. She, like, that's what she wanted. She... And then she hated everybody that, I think there was an interaction between her and, oh my God, wh why can't I think of her name? Sorry. Reese Witherspoon. I'll use a real Madeline. name. Madeline. How she was just like, oh, you're just a blonde. What? Like, <laughs> or short. Yeah. She says something about short people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, short people. <laughs> Julianne, you it took offense, like, didn't her you? <laughs> little, her little baby boy could never do anything wrong, and there was nothing ever wrong with her little baby boy. It was and like the so, epitome of being yeah. married to a mama boy's, mm -hmm. like, oh, it, yeah. it was yeah. awful. It was awful. And perfect. Awful and perfect. And per perfect. At the same time. Mm -hmm. Merle Streep was amazing. Yeah. And it's almost like they casted her because they're like, we're going to write this season and it's going to be horrible and we <laughs> need somebody to star in it so everybody will love her. And it's like she went, mm -hmm. I will do this for mankind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I Pretty much. She did that. She did that for us. I she don't did. think they were trying it to is, make it horrible. <laughs> well, I feel like cool. they wrote it and then they had to cast it and they're like, we need some help. <laughs> so I, no, I think I'm tired. I think you have some heavy hitters behind the scenes that some I mean, Nicole and Meryl, I think, are friends in real life. <laughs> well, oh, what I, I think it's I'm cool, sure like are. you don't often get to see an actress, you know, of the caliber of Meryl Streep be able to play the same character in, like, many different episodes. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, right. it, it, it's happening more and more now with streaming. But, I mean, she's just... Meryl's on another level. We all mm -hmm. know that. And to mm -hmm. see her, like, really flesh that character out into just somebody that you just love to hate, it's amazing to watch her do that. Like, you I mean that woman like you somewhere in your life you've met that woman oh i've met that woman oh yes <laughs> mom it's not her who's mom? it's not i said it's not your mom <laughs> but i'm I've just kidding I'm, just, <laughs> wow. I'm totally just kidding but her interactions with each character are just so 
I mean, so good. You can't, it's like, and you know, essentially, to some degree, you almost know where it's going to go. It's like watching a train wreck in slow motion, but just the way she's able to interact with each of, you know, Celeste's friends and get, I mean, she gets right under Madeline's skin, like, right away. She knows the exact buttons to push, and the way that she does it, and just the way that she reacts to it after she knows that she's won that interaction... I mean, there, it's just so good. So I brilliant. love that dynamic with Reese Witherspoon and Meryl Streep is phenomenal. It's awesome to watch because it's like cringy. It's oh, yeah. so cringy. Yeah, it's so cringy. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's bad. Well, and then being in Celeste's position, like, what are you supposed to do at that point? You're kind of right. stuck. Stuck completely. Yeah. Like, she needs the help. You know, she needs to have somebody there to help her with the boys, but she's stuck with this woman who is just pulling at this thread of, you know, Celeste's lie. And you know, you know, she's doing it for all the, well, I guess, right reasons. You could argue that, but it's just, you know, it's going to come to a head. Like, there's just this tension that is building this whole time. And man, how satisfying is it to watch her slap her in the face? (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Yeah, she's sitting there interacting with the boys, and you can't, obviously, she's kind of in a similar position that she was with Perry. Like, you can't, she can't speak ill of their grandmother. You know, again, there is the the relationship and everything. Gosh, it's just so, I don't know. I love Celeste. I think she's kind of a beast. She's, mm-hmm. she's still my favorite mm-hmm. character in this season. She was my favorite character the first time. She's my favorite character this season. I think she has a lot, in some ways, a lot more to kind of expand into as Celeste in season two. Yeah, Because of the fact that she's reacting to so many different stressors between the memory, the true love she still has for Perry. She's very much living out the abuse and power cycle in that relationship even after his death. The flashback scenes that they show, which were actually really well shot i loved the the moment where you see the videotape that the boys were holding the ipad and it's just through and beyond the door crack yeah Yeah. Yeah. i mean there's just a lot of things that nicole kidman is able to do with this character that in some ways has impressed me far more in this performance than some of even her other performances because there's so much nuance and she plays it very quietly and very determinedly until the courtroom when she builds toward that sort of powerhouse place as the attorney mm-hmm. defending herself in a way. Yeah, since you've already brought it up, that's easily my favorite episode of the whole season. Easily. The whole courtroom thing. I would 100% the, agree with you. Mm-hmm. The whole, that whole build towards everything happening and her finally laying into her mother-in-law and just putting her in her place and doing it in such a smart, intelligent, and then bringing that, that realism of what she was going through to the forefront so everyone could truly see while she's still grieving, while she's still trying to accept what her relationship was, while she's still dealing with this mother-in-law who has tried to manipulate every part of her situation since without any sort of understanding of what she's been through. there's See, this is the reason why I still enjoy season two, because we've talked about it in our other podcast, but character development really drives how much I feel fall into a show and just everything that happens with Celeste alone even in that one episode makes that whole season worth it to me Mm -hmm. and she was because you also feel everybody's reaction too I mean once everybody finally gets to full-on experience and to know that even her closest friends like even if they kind of knew to like really know what it was that she's been dealing with this whole time and still showing up and walking into that courtroom and saying, don't you tell me how I am as a mom and how I, you know, how I care about my boys. I mean, that to me is seriously, like Kylie said, probably one of the most powerful performances that I've seen in like a really long time. Well, yes, she was trying to take those boys away from her. She was Mm -hmm. trying to take custody of those boys. Like, you're going to do everything you can to fight for that, you know? Those are your Mm -hmm. children. So, yeah, I totally agree. It's like, 
stunning. I like how they had her portray the realness of grieving. Like that wasn't, yeah. it, it was so, that performance was so raw that it just, it came off as like super real to me. I think that's why it's my favorite episode is that they paid homage to she's grieving and she's been losing so much in her life. Like, I mean, in reality, she's lost her husband. She lost her friends. Like, I mean, she's put her friends through this. She's losing her boys because her boys don't have a father anymore and she doesn't know exactly what to do. And I mean, I think she just got to a melting point where it was finally time for her to just explode. And she exploded with class, at least in my eyes. I think she did. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the reasons Celeste is such a great character is that she's incredibly complex. Like she's so incredibly strong. Like all these things we've talked about her doing, all of the things that she's put through, but she's still vulnerable. Like Mm -hmm. she has so many facets to her. And I think that's one of the things that makes her such a fascinating character. And I think she's a character that feels very human too. No, she she portrays a very like quiet strength, which I think Mm -hmm. is so like compelling about her character and the way that she plays it and it's, it's so different from maybe the way that like Renata shows her strength yeah Renata's like a bull in a china shop kind of oh yeah exactly <laughs> Renata's yes. still my least favorite character I feel oh like. she's my favorite character I love her too Julia yeah. I love her too <laughs> yeah she, she's my absolute favorite character, especially in this season she does so much she, does, oh she gets to do so much I mean right. it's could be my Laura Dern love. Like, I have just this unending love for Laura Dern, but, like, my God. No, I think that's weird because you'd see more into her relationship to this season. Mm-hmm. So you kind of almost get, again, another glimpse more so than you did in the... See, I think there's more development in this season because you get more so of a glimpse into kind of where her drive is coming from. And, again, there's more cracks in her situation, too. Yeah, her husband's a dink. <laughs> Uh, yes. He's an idiot. <laughs> there, there was Bro. One there. And I noticed <laughs> it this time around. I noticed it this time around. There is one thing from the book that that they put in this season, like a specific plot point from the book they used for season two was that that he was having an affair with their French nanny. Yeah, total dick. Uh. <laughs> That's in the book, but it's not in the first season. And when I when I rewatched for our first recording after when I rewatched the first season after reading the book, I was like, oh, that's that's not in there. Okay, they must have just left it out. And then rewatching season two, I was like, oh, that's where they put that. Oh, oh yeah. bam! <laughs> I was well, like, oh, I, still in there. <laughs> I kind of love, so like, you know, by no means would I say Renata is the most sympathetic character. Absolutely not. No, but she's not absolutely not. my favorite character. And I think part of why is like, the unraveling that happens with her and her husband, like, it is episode by episode, this, like, the hits just keep on coming, like, buying out their bankrupt, and then, you know, going through the embarrassment of, like, losing all the possessions in your home, and then going to that. I, and it's everything that she's built. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's all hers. Like, it's all My favorite hers. thing is when she screams, it's my money. She, like, mm-hmm. screams yes. it, like, five times. She's like, she does not go to visit him because she loves him. She literally goes because she's like, you stole my life. Mm-hmm. Like, how am I, I going to sh- live without fancy things? <laughs> when she yeah, smashes, when she smashes the train set. Well, okay, so she's like grappling. Like, again, you, you're you married to somebody and you think that there's like this mutual understanding. And then again, you find out, and she's probably coming from a place of, I'm carrying your ass. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then this is what's coming from this, and on top of it, you're screwing the nanny. Like I would have lost my balls too. Amen. I would have been like, you seriously? I would have been like, let's go. When she like like she loses her crap in the game room, right? Hell yeah! Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not you and your stupid crap. He's like, no way. Yeah, it's not no, just a game no. room. There are toys. There's yeah. model yeah. trains and and business. Like he. And you want to know what? You can have your collectibles for real, bro. And then he's like, oh, don't! I sold the... Like, screw you, dude. Yeah, Figure sorry. it out. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> well, and I think 
think what makes her snap too is because in that scene he was like yeah I sold the train set but the person I told sold it to is gonna let me keep it like as the caretaker so he's still gonna get to like play with all his toys yeah, he, no. they're like he's the one who screwed <laughs> up but he's not gonna have to face the exactly that's actions mm-hmm. you know, she's over here losing everything and it's not it's a metaphor out. about him oh. having all his cake and eating it too exactly he's the one who messed up but he doesn't have to deal with the consequences <laughs> he did not mess up but she's dealing with all the consequences i think that's what causes her to finally snap absolutely and i, I think too like her her main motivation is to give <laughs> <I'm> broken. <Kylie. laughs> because because <laughs> yes i'm so glad this is recorded Again, this is the first time that the three of us are all on one panel together. So Hillary is going about her business, Callie's expression. (laughs) Watching you, she's about to lose her crap, so I'm like losing my crap. It was, you just had to watch it. Anyways, Renata's pretty, I feel for her, and I would totally lose my shit. Oh yeah, Mm. amen. Something I really like about Renata, too, is that she's not likable. Like... (laughs) Well, I'm glad we all agreed <laughs> that she's not likable. <laughs> no, no, the, something I think that's interesting about her character, like, I feel like with female characters, like, they're so often sorted into, like, sympathetic or unsympathetic. Like, you are, like, you you as a viewer are being herded into one of two camps. You know, whereas, like, what your opinion is supposed to be on this character. And that's one thing that I love about her is that, like, she is, she isn't completely likable. She's kind of a bitch. <laughs> kind but, of a bitch? Yeah. Kind and she of, does some, like, kind of. Hyperbole. <laughs> you're but, being not, you're being too well, much. Nice. Just be like, like okay, a, okay, she's an absolute bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Okay, oh, but yeah. I can't, I gotta yeah. edit that yeah. word. <laughs> Just but, but I, I mean, not to get all, like, societal commentary, but a lot of times that's kind of how you have to be when you're in the sort of power role that oh, she is oh, in. Right. I was just going to yeah. say, she has to be like that, or she wouldn't have gotten where she was at. Mm-hmm. And what what sucks is that a man is the one that destroyed it for mm-hmm. her. Exactly. Yeah. Like, not she has man, had to man, she's, work know. that hard and be that blunt and be and like be that kind of person in order to achieve what she's achieved and that means that she's not likable that means that people but people really do not like her and particularly other women really don't like her and i think that's something that this show does really well is just like 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 female friendships but also like female rivalries like the way that society pits successful women against each other really well absolutely in this show and i think that's one of the things To circle back to my original point, that's one of the things I like about that character, though, is that, like, she's not written really into either camp of, like, you totally feel for her and you totally sympathize with her, or you completely hate her and just, like, just absolutely despise her guts. Like, she, she's a bit of both, and I love that. More, more nuanced female characters pulls. Okay, so I have to say this, even though I am extremely gay. And, <laughs> Not just but a little, I'm the only, extremely. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for that explanation. Yeah, you're happy, welcome. Happy coming but out day, I, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> this is such perfect timing. <laughs> Amazing. I had just in case you guys idea. didn't know, I'm extremely, no. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> as the man on the panel if we could go that far to say that i have to say that it is so nice to watch a show that is filled with real women Mm. i feel like women in shows get the raw end of the deal and it's it's really nice to see real women interactions with each other and showing real like i feel like the problem with some of these characters is that they're all jealous of each other in certain ways They Mm -hmm. all want to be each other, and they all want what each other has. And a lot of times in some shows, we see the woman being jealous of the man because she wishes she could get there because he's a man, which you don't get that in the show. They are all powerful women in their own aspect and where they are in life. And I just wanted to say that as the man on the podcast. Thank you very much. (laughs) You're (laughs) so 
the one time that well I will done. listen to what someone says after the words, as a man. Right. <laughs> he should have said as a gay man. And he did. He like, started oh, off being extremely I mean, gay. He, <laughs> he started off by saying he was extremely gay, so I guess that counts. Mm-hmm. Right. He, 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 pro- he appropriately prefaced yes. and qualified. Yeah. <laughs> right. Not that a heterosexual man can't have an opinion, however, yes. No, Just they're right. never allowed to have any opinions. This is going to go over allowed. well. If you're listening you... to this, tweet at us in the podcast <laughs> about how you feel about this gender commentary. But Extremely no. gay, big little lies. Yeah. <laughs> that should be the hashtag for this episode. The hidden hashtag, extremely gay. <laughs> He's right, though. I feel like I do know all of these women. Mm-hmm. But like I've right. met all of these women, I've exactly. known all of these women in my life. So yeah, for sure, yeah. I get it. So speaking of knowing these women, we've talked about the strong, probably the strongest personalities, and certainly the strongest in terms of fame, I guess, actors. But we also have Jane, and we also have Bonnie. And in some ways, Jane maybe wasn't as omnipresent in this season as she was in the first season because her son wasn't at the center of it quite as much. However, Bonnie was much more at the center than she was in the first season. So talk about those two. I really yeah. like Zoe Kravitz. I love oh, yeah. her. Yeah, she's so good. She's so good. I said this in the last one, but I really can't wait for her to be Catwoman. Because mm. she's, like, perfect for Selena Kyle. I just can't even. Yeah. But what her what she has to go through is obviously pretty intense. And then to come to grips again, you see the relationship that she has with her parents. And then you kind of see her own realizations unfold throughout, like, obviously the events and her dealing with her own sense of grief and guilt. And then kind of what she learns about herself and her relationship. I mean, ah, uh, it was it was painful to watch for her, but she did such a great job. Again, these people, it just feels so raw and so real. Her Her grief, just her grief from her actions which were warranted and you know you know i i felt like they in my opinion they were warranted but just the first few episodes of her dealing with her grief her acting was incredible just you could see her pain so Mm -hmm. well just the weight of everything she's yeah and she you can tell she's not used to like living in that type of lie no Mm -hmm. not at all what did you think about the angle that mom had visions sort of psychic pieces i thought that was fine Kelly's like, what did you? I'm like, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I thought it was interesting. I, I mean, I could have done without it. it yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't really care. Out. I mean, it was really just so she could be like, say to, you know, Nathan, you don't know where are you at. Like, you don't know. <laughs> That's basically all that was yeah, for. Yeah. Was so that she could call him out for being a crap husband. Yeah. Was basically. Yeah. Having it. And having not it. being aware like, here you are, you're in this relationship, it's your second marriage with my daughter, and you don't know her. She's drowning. But that was still also pretty intense, I felt. I just took it as another way for her to abuse her. To control yeah. her. To control well, her. Well, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I do have to say that what I love about what I feel led Bonnie to do what she did for Celeste wasn't because of a man. No. I love that she just did it because she was abused and being abused just period is crap. So was, I, I, I loved that we we learned that she was, she was abused, but that, I mean, I don't love that we learned she was abused. It, but but that it was it defensive. It was right. a defensive was, mechanism. Right. Yeah. yeah. Pure yeah, and simple. Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of people probably would have still had that sort of reaction even without her history. Correct. Right. It right. just yeah. added to her layer. She's an onion, you know. Right. But I mean, for most oh. for most shows and like most writers, they would have made though they would have made. I just used a real name. That's they would have okay. made. They would have <laughs> made Bonnie be abused by a man so that she yeah. could relate. That's mm-hmm. what I just, I love the whole dynamic of her story, how it's still mm-hmm. related that abuse at the end of the day, sexual, mental, whatever it is. It's still mm-hmm. abuse. Well, mm-hmm. and, and then the actions she took towards what she perceived rightly to be an abuser was just another extension of the power abuse cycle, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. there's there's fight, there's 
flight freezer fight response she chose to fight in this particular mm-hmm. instance so and it just happened to be that perry was a manifestation of the sort of the monster the skeleton in her own closet which i mm-hmm. think was interesting so to that end yes i agree i i thought zoe kravitz did a very great job this season and i actually really enjoyed learning about her family unit and Mm -hmm. not about the abuse piece the verbal and otherwise emotional abuse but about the the complexities of her own upbringing and how those interwove not only into her marriage but into her relationship with her own daughter into her relationship with her friends i mean i i think the best part of this show to me is goes even beyond the relationships between the five core women it's their families and how they all interrelate as a village if you will and this the breakfast club <laughs> mm. <laughs> sorry and everything relates back to, sorry i didn't mean to throw you up but seriously like everything relates back to the breakfast club she's right though we learned very little about her background in the first season correct we mm-hmm. knew hardly anything about her in the mm-hmm. first season, and then we got all of this information in the second. So it was a nice, like, segue into her life. Yeah. Yeah. The show does, particularly, I think, in the second season, the show does intergenerational trauma really well. And, Kylie, yeah. you were kind of saying this earlier, like, like how that that environment that she grew up in affected her, made her the person that she is, to a certain extent, dictates how she interacts with her own child and in her own marriage like those environments affect you like that even even if you work through them like you're like obviously you're it's not like saying if you if you grew up in an abusive household mentally emotionally physically whatever like there's no hope obviously there is hope but it does does stick with you and if you don't deconstruct that it will perpetuate itself and I think that's something I, I think particularly yeah with those those two family units with Bonnie and her mom and that family as well as with Mary Louise and Celeste seeing how it does how for instance Mary Louise parented Perry dictates dictated what kind of father and husband he was and what kind of home environment it created with him and Celeste and their boys and then how that's affecting the boys and I think that's one of the things that adds to the stakes of that whole question with the custody between Mary Louise and Celeste is that court case, that that question is going to determine not just who raises these boys, but probably ultimately what kind of men they're going to turn out to be. Because we see that Mary Louise is making excuses for Perry, blind to his behavior, not willing to even entertain the possibility that he could have hurt Celeste or anyone else can't even like when she finds out that Ziggy is Perry's son like immediate denial and then when it becomes kind of impossible for her to deny that he's Ziggy's father switches immediately to victim blaming and then you contrast that with Celeste when when she finds out that it was I think it was Max that was bullying Amabella in season Mm -hmm. one one of the Mm -hmm. twins was bullying the little girl because he's mirroring that behavior that he sees his his father treating his mother with she she steps in she stops it she addresses it so yeah. two very different ways of handling that absolutely so speaking of ziggy how about jane's part of the story i think this would probably be like one of the season two misses for me like i just felt like jane's story was not as compelling this season to sort of like to make way for characters to have like more compelling arcs like because of the arc we have with bonnie like i was kind of okay with that trade-off but it i don't know it kind of felt like they were like well jane is still here we're just gonna kind of like put her over but here i mean what I else felt, were they, i felt like what, i felt what like she wasn't they, needed what, her bangs, what else were they supposed yeah. to do with her her abuser has been identified her child right. child's father has been identified like what that was the whole like first season was this person yeah. that was the whole first season and we're we're done with that so we just needed her son to become like a hookup doctor that's he was oh. so big on them being together that's what we needed <laughs> <laughs> She's what like, yeah you're right it's, it's like she was just kind of are you talking about there. her flirtation with that guy yes yes 
Yeah. I do I do love him. That actor is on one of my other favorite shows. He's in The Alienist. And so when I when I first saw it, I remember being like, Oh look who it is. But Oh, yeah, how I is that show? Him. How is The Alienist? I love that book. So good. So good. Oh my god. So really? <laughs> So is I'm obsessed with the book. Patty, you've watched it? Yes. You want me to add you to the panel that Anna Cedar... I knew that word coming. <laughs> do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not talk about that more because this will turn into an alias <laughs> podcast panel. Which is um, not this I... pod. That's another podcast, which is apparently on our list because Anna's very excited about it. P.S. Side note, Hillary, like the moment you said Breakfast Club, all that's going through my head now are Breakfast Club quotes. Most predominantly, I'm trying out for a scholarship <laughs> is what's going through my head. <laughs> like, I mean, the whole yeah. movie is quotable. I can't but... believe you did that to me. <laughs> right I'm <now>. sorry. <laughs> what is happening? No it's way. what? It's, I know. I it's know. one of my top fives of all time. It was really I would just like to you were, throw it was, out it was to good. everybody how this podcast quote. is going is how season two of the show went. It was everywhere. <laughs> it was everywhere. Yeah, that's right. That's see, see, we're on team. We might, we might not be on maybe, team. Maybe. Maybe. I was going to say, maybe all them girls were drinking Aldi wine. <laughs> We don't own any or sponsorship from Aldi. Aldi did not give us permission. <laughs> but we love it. Anyways. Hi. <laughs> we love anyway, it. Anyway, never mind. Anyways, back back to the topic at hand. I actually yeah. kind of disagree. I liked what they had going on for Jane. I agree that it's not like maybe quite as compelling as some of the other storylines we have going on because like there's a lot there's a lot going on in this season. Even it's messy, but it sure ain't boring. But I, I kind of liked the fact that, like, A, obviously they still kept her in the show, but that they didn't put her through, like, a new thing. Like, they didn't, like, they didn't give her new trauma. They followed her as she still dealt with the old. Like, yeah, what, she, just, what uh, she was already dealing with. Because I feel like so often in media characters with characters who have had something traumatic happen to them and they especially if they keep it a secret you know they divulge their secret at the end we find we find out what happened they confront their their attacker their abuser you know whatever and then that's it that's the end and it's kind of implied that once you have that confrontation then poof your trauma is gone and that's obviously not how any of this works so i kind of liked the fact that like her like, not, not only is she still related to the main plot, which is we're trying to keep this a secret, but her kind of thing that she has going on individually is that she's just trying to be a normal person. Like, she is just trying to build. Yeah. Like, yeah. and I I love that for her. I want that for her so much. Like, she deserves that. it. And I do think that there's still some compelling, some compelling scenes with her, some compelling moments, especially as she's, like, working through her fear basically her fear of intimacy both emotional and physical because i i do understand what that's like to try to want so bad to trust another person after you've been hurt and having such a hard time with that and not knowing that it's not a reflection of the person that you're now with and not wanting them to feel like it's their fault but also feeling that like you know pushing yourself is hurting yourself more and like feeling bad because this other person has to deal with your trauma when they haven't done anything like that's to me that is really compelling and it's like I said it's something I understand so watching her scenes actually meant a lot to me I feel like Anna Laura has these glasses on that peer directly into everybody's soul <laughs> me and my little Warby Parker glasses just <laughs> We also don't own any rights to advertise <laughs> Warby Parker. <laughs> that she just, like, sees the struggles in everybody and feels like everybody is giving their best to offer. Do you know what I mean? Like, this outlook of life, Anna Laura, that you have. <laughs> so you're like, no. She's a character. She's there. She's there for a purpose. And there's a reason for it. <laughs> 
just trying our best, okay? <laughs> Well, and if it makes you any... You sweet soul. You sweetheart. You <laughs> got to I try. Soul. I try so hard. And I think it is very funny when people... Me, when people say stuff like this to me, because I don't think of myself as that kind of person. Oh, I think so of myself as before. a... I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think of myself as, like, a very uncharitable person. <laughs> but I, I... But I guess I, no. I, I work... I work very hard to try to be understanding... <laughs> And I guess it's working. So it is you. working. <laughs> it is working. Well, well, you got it, girl. I mean, it unlocked. Yeah. I think you're dripping with empathy, actually. Yeah, exactly. Which is not a bad thing. <laughs> I, I, I'm also a very empathic person, but you put, yeah. Anyways, good job, Anna Laura. But I agree with everything that you said about Jane. And I think watching her, I mean, I think they purposely pulled back from that. I mean, it was purposeful, but still watching her go through the pain. I mean, she still was going through a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. It just was a different kind. Yeah. yeah. And it was just the ripple effect. And it's showing, again, it's it's kind of subjects that a lot of stories shy away from. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there that have experienced what Jane has experienced. Mm -hmm. And that is cause and effect. And you're getting to see it in a very real way. And I think it's almost educational and important for people to see. And I think I, that Shane Lee did a really good job. As I do have to say I like with Jane how they how they showed how she was still traumatized from being like raped and, and whatnot and how when she got into a relationship that she wanted to express those feelings that it's really hard to move on. And I like how they showed how raw that truly can be and that it it's emotional and it's emotionally hard to move forward from that. I would, I would echo that my, the day job that I shouldn't quit really kind of traffics in this sort of stuff, which is why I keep saying things like the power control cycle, power abuse cycle. But I also agree. I liked the fact that even though she wasn't quite as present, the way she was used in the story where it, in a very purposeful way and showing very much that aftermath because she really had two pieces it was trying to become intimate with somebody in a loving and romantic way in a way mm -hmm. she felt comfortable to express physically emotionally and so on after her trauma but also dealing with the fact that she was parenting a child of this union who was learning that his real father was Perry and that he was not the nicest dude in the block. And so he had a lot of uncomfortable questions, especially when Mary Louise started inserting herself into their lives, trying to forge a relationship when she could yeah finally accept oh the my idea God. That, that was so creepy well we just literally so forgot creepy. about that part disgusting meryl street in that level of unsettling again that i was talking about yeah she was like and stalking them yeah she's like yeah, yeah she the was car, just like dropping like in out of the blue them. And just being very direct, like, I, oh, I think I deserve a relationship with him, yeah. too. And it's like, meanwhile, this um, poor child is still being bullied at school. Yeah. And is, yeah. It, bullied for a whole different reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ziggy is a tank. Yeah. I've gone through some stuff. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I love the way, too, that Jane parents Ziggy. Just, like, generally, mm -hmm. I think I maybe said this during the season one panel. But, like, I think especially in season two, as he's starting to learn all of these, like, really terrible things about his biological father, her, the way that she explains it all to him, the way that she is honest with him about it, that she's explaining what these mer words mean, because, like, he didn't know what assault meant, he didn't know that word, so she explains it in a way that, like, a six, seven-year-old child could understand, like, she is... She's being open with him about it. She's being truthful with him about it, but she is bringing it to his level. And I think she's also doing her best to understand that, like, his biological father's actions don't have any bearing on who Ziggy is. Right. Where she's like, you're my child. You're my son. And again, like, bringing it back to that whole theme of intergenerational trauma, where she is very much doing her best to parent Ziggy because she loves him and because she doesn't want him to have to carry that burden. Yeah. What about the I agree with everything you just said. Yeah. <laughs> what about the husbands? Aside from Renata's, we talked about Gordon for a little bit and his dinkdom. 
What about the <laughs> other husbands, like Ed, for example, and work and Madeline? And Dude, Adam. I love Adam Scott. I know me I too. Him. I also love Adam <laughs> Scott. Too. I think like I really enjoy the scenes with Madeline and Ed because it feels like pretty real. Like it's it could be pretty marriage. like true to life, like a real marriage and. He's dealing with a lot this season with the revelation of Madeline sleeping with the theater director. And that whole reveal is just so, so mm-hmm. messy mm-hmm. and so, it's so oh, hard to watch. It's so, it's that's so another cringe. Watch. That's another cringy. It's so Super cringy. Super cringy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Brutal. It's brutal. Yeah. Theater people, man. The worst. <laughs> theater people, the worst. Ooh. <laughs> it's an inside joke, folks, because all but one of the people on this panel would classify themselves at one point in their life as a theater person. <laughs> and the one who isn't is celebrating. <laughs> And he's ecstatic that she's not a theater person. Get it. Listen, bro, I'm fine with being an audience member. I love it. There you go. <laughs> we don't play yeah. our cards. We were talking yeah. about the husbands. Yeah, we're talking about the husbands. We're talking about the awkward affair business. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's about as awkward as it's it is. It's like yeah. uncomfortable. It is it is really it it is really uncomfortable to watch. Like it is it is very hard to watch. But I think that is one of the things that like makes it so good. Like it's very effective. Yeah. And I do appreciate too that like it's not like 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 the re- the way it re- that storyline resolves is it like oh like we had one conversation and now oh, everything's fine. Like this this show doesn't do pretty little bows, and that's something that I appreciate because that's not how real life is. Like they make a commitment to, like they renew their vows and they you know kind of recommit to their marriage, but like acknowledging that it's gonna take work. That like that that symbol of renewing their vows isn't like a like slaps and spackle on it. Our marriage is fine now. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, plus it's almost because my perception of it is, is like sometimes when people veer off, or I feel like statistically a lot of people veer off because of maybe there is something fundamentally missing. And my perception of Madeline is just like, I mean, maybe there is a little bit of truth to that, but I still feel like it was just more in her character at that moment. Where she was just more giving into the weaknesses of everything. So that almost made it more complicated. One of my favorite scenes from this season is the scene where Madeline and Ed are talking about just like kind of what happens. And he was talking about their first date and how on their first date he felt like she was interviewing him for like a family family man and you know, had, like, very specific questions. Because you wanted what was different. Yeah, and he was like, and I came to terms with that. And I, I was okay with that. But you were the one that, that became unokay with that and had to stray outside of it. So I think she, you know, sort of, like, I don't know. I just, I find their relationship so, like, realistic in sort of, like, this, like, ebb and, and flow. And I liked to see that they, like, rekindled towards the end of the season but still, like, looming underneath everything, she has the lie of what's happened with Perry. And, like, she's kind of the one that I'm made sure this lie is. happen, in yeah. a way. Like, yeah. she was the one that kind of, like, told everybody their roles. So, when they're, like, recommitting to their relationship at the end, like, as much as I love that scene, like, there is sort of this, like, storm cloud over it for me where I'm, like, but she still has one more lie that he doesn't know about. I think that with that situation, too, it opens up the question of, like, when you are in a committed relationship like that, are you actually obligated to share everything with that person when the secret is someone else's? And I think it comes up, like, when it gets revealed to the kind of, the the, the characters outside that core group that Perry is Ziggy's father, and he finds out about it, and he's mad that she didn't tell him, and she's like, well, it wasn't my secret to tell like that was kind of Jane and Celeste thing like I think it does kind of open up that question like is she obligated to tell him that or should she keep the secret for her friends like 
And I think that's that that is a difficult situation. I think one of the interesting It's another fact. I was going to say I think one of the interesting facets of this season generally but that kind of is really driven home by the Madeline Ed storyline is that the the women in the five that are the harder women, if you will, the more bitchy, the more strong, the more less sympathetic women soften this season in many ways. While the ones who seem gentle and seem a little less resolute in the first season almost harden and take an opposite direction as they converge in the middle with this pact that they have not to tell the truth about Perry's murder... And so it's interesting to, to consider whether or not somebody said it might have been Hillary or you, Anna, whether or not Madeline is being real in these moments, especially mm-hmm. with Ed. You know, I think that the way I took it, especially by the end of the season, was that some part of her still is still always going to be that Madeline that we met from the very first episode. But I do think she's learned some lessons through everything that's happened, just like Celeste has, just like Jane has, just like Bonnie has, just like Renata has. And I think that even if it might not execute terribly perfectly, if there is a season three, I I imagine they'd be building on this storyline. Mm-hmm. I think she sincerely believes she's going to try because she does love Ed on some level. Yeah, I think she does love him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think there will always be secrets. Yeah, especially with those two because there's that mm-hmm. that's the one observation that I think you can easily make and there is very little dispute about is they're so different. Ed and Madeline yeah. are so different. From the very first time you meet them, you wonder, now how did that happen other than... He's such a, a dramatic swing from what's from, Nathan. from yeah. Nathan, yeah. yeah. Which is an interesting point. Like, I, you know, maybe Madeline fell in love with an idealized version of what it is to be in a relationship with someone, you know? She fell in love with the idea of him, maybe not him so much, Who, but maybe so, you know, maybe, maybe now, maybe now it does become more about that because she is a version of herself who has learned these lessons. But, you know, at the end of the day, Ed is most concerned about their truth and the intimacy and the honesty in their relationship. And if that is something that he really values, not knowing this level of lie, having that come to light will, I would think it would and that would destroy them. That would end them. Mm-hmm. This is why I like shows like this, because you can continue to, and we talk about this since half these people are in the Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Yeah. Like, <laughs> shows, shows like that that are just extremely, it's so, it leaves you with so much to analyze and so many thought per- because it's so ambiguous, there's so many ways you can really perceive and analyze what's happening. That's a really and interesting, who knows? I was going to say that's a really interesting comparison because if you think about it, they're two totally different genres and entirely different shows. But the commonalities that the Breaking Bad two shows have and Big Little Lies have is this incredibly nuanced complex not cookie cutter character work and beautiful direction and cinematography behind it and secondarily good soundtracks because i love the soundtrack on this show oh so good the soundtrack on the other two julie i immediately thought julianne (laughs) (laughs) she loves this yeah i do I do. It's like, this would already be on a Spotify playlist for me, Mm -hmm. pretty much everything in this show. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so moody. It just sets the scene (laughs) so well. Yeah. Hillary, did I say what you, did you want to say now? You forgot. No, I think you tapped off what I was already starting to say. Cool. I mean, basically it's dope. It's dope. (laughs) Hashtag it's dope. Hashtag. Is that this and Breaking Bad? Well, yes, Breaking no, Bad is it's awesome. It's all dope. I haven't watched Breaking Bad. Don't yell at me. Don't yell at me. <laughs> hey, what? Don't yell at me. In the hell. Don't yell at me. This was my life until last year, so I sympathize and commiserate with you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I know. I, I know it. it's on my list. I know it's on my list. I'm working on it. I can attest that it's totes worth it. <laughs> it's so, worth it. It's worth it. Very, very, very much so. My sisters say it's worth it, and they have good they have good opinions and taste. 
So I trust them. So yes, it's on my list. Fair enough. Girl. I know. <laughs> don't be mad. Me. I'm kicked out of the family now. I'm just kicked out of the family. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I no. Like, not over that. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> family so far. We're going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> she almost didn't get that out. That's funny. <laughs> We're gonna help you. <laughs> We're gonna help you. <laughs> uh, anyways, is there anything um, else you want to say about season two of Big Little Lies, the show we're talking about? Oh yes. Yeah. Can we talk about that ending? By I all feel means. like that's what. Oh yeah, that's really what we started off with, and <laughs> yeah. Mm. But we'll bring it right back around. And Eddie is, like, moaning in the corner. I know. He's, like, ready. Go. I do not like that ending. I it actually... It's the whole freaking point. That's why. Oh. It's so bad. Well, if, if we ever... If, which is a big if, as previously discussed, if we ever get a season three, I think, like, if they explore the implications of them doing that, what is then, it that... then it could be worth it. Who would However, like to explain what happens get, in the ending? Who would like to set that up for the listener? What happens at the end? Okay, so in the ending of Big Little Lies Season 2, all the all the ladies meet on the beach like they have been all season. They, anytime anything happens, they meet on the beach and they're like, oh no, we're going to get found out. And then they're like, no, 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 we can't say anything. Just don't say anything. And then, and then they don't say anything. But this time, they walk into, there's, there's this like kind of emotional scene they're all getting out of their cars. I think it goes black for a second, too. Yes. Yeah. Like, they're they're all getting out of their cars and walking into the police station together. They walk into the police station together. And then credits. And, it, and, and credits. And that's it. And I literally, evidently, I can't say the word I actually said, but I said, like, I said, what the heck. And evidently, after watching it for the first time, I deleted that ending from my memory. I guess I was so mad about it, I just straight up deleted it. Because when I rewatched it for this panel, I was like, what the heck? This makes me so mad. And I was like, how did I forget about this? I'm you so mad. You potty mouth. Yeah. She, I know. She's How substituting dare I for that. what she actually <laughs> said. <laughs> that was the most perfect setup I've ever heard ever. That was beautiful. Perfect. That was a beautiful Thank recap, by the way. It was. It was. It was. And and what's crazy about it is that was more exciting than actually watching the show. <laughs> I'm glad I could. I'm glad I could provide that for you. I'm glad I could give you give you all that experience. Um, I feel like the blackout on the screen. I remember when the screen blacks out. I'm like, is that it? I really, yeah. I really, I was like, oh, okay, no, there's more. Okay, great. And then when they went in the police station, I was like, is this another blackout? Is that like, is it? What's Wait. that? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. What? See, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Because is the ending for season one kind of a cliffhanger? Yes, absolutely. You see them all together on the beach, and you see these, like, binoculars that they're looking through, and then you, like, so you know that that cop is still watching them. Like, she's still suspicious. And so you're left with this, like, oh, these, they're they're all, like, you're presented with this kind of, like, picture-perfect ending, but then there's still this kind of, like, I don't, I don't know if I want to say gloom, there's still this, like, threat hanging over them and it cuts to black and that was supposed to be all we ever got that was supposed to be the ending for the show so the ending for the show was supposed to be the they got away with it or did they and you'll never know and to me that is the perfect ending for this story this ending i feel like would only work if they make a season three like i feel like this ending doesn't really work on its own like if this is the ending to the entire series like they walk into the police station and then that's it that yeah, doesn't do it for me they set it up i think they set it up in the hopes of having a season three which like would be great but let that's not likely let's it's be real it's not likely but i think like, that's what they did i think and, they set it up and i don't like that i do not like when <laughs> Shows you don't. <laughs> I, I guess I, they're I getting to know each other in now. a general manner. I don't really like it when shows do that, where they do like cliffhangers without being able to resolve it. The with, prospect. Without, without you don't need to know that action. there is at least the prospect. Yes. 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 Without I mean, the they, written contract of a next season. Yes, but they and don't like, have to that. Me, 
I know that I might sound like a little bit of a hypocrite because I just said that season one is a cliffhanger. It was the perfect ending. I The thing I like about that is its ambiguity. I feel like that's a good example of an ambiguous ending. You don't think there's ambiguity with this ending? That's, that's what I was going to say because I actually don't really have too much of a problem with this ending. I don't either. <laughs> because I think it doesn't necessarily mean they went into the police station, they confessed everything, and they all went to jail forever. Like, I agree 100% with Julianne. I no, but could, I don't think they went in like, there and confessed. I think it, it's almost like... They want you to think that's what's happening. You don't necessarily right. know. Right. right. Exactly. But the issue is that I have with it is it's like we've been trying to avoid the police for so freaking mm-hmm. long. Like, we have gone in circles and in circles, and now we're just going to walk in, and that's it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, well, how do you know? I mean, Madeline probably has something up her dang sleeve. I mean, these women have some balls on them, okay? And the bottom line is, they're all going down with each other, and they're going down swinging no matter what. That's already been explained in about 16 different ways. You so, so cold. I wish everybody could see you right now. I had to check the temperature in Grand Rapids because I was like, is it really that cold? She's not yeah, cold. I am not cold at all. <laughs> it was 80 degrees She's today. Bugging. It was 80 degrees today. First off, I'm in my basement. Also, I'm always hot. I'm just kind of, I've had a lot of wine. <laughs> 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 like, my favorite temperature out. is 50 degrees. I am not even remotely cold. I'm just. <laughs> that, that was the best explanation. I've just had a lot of wine. <laughs> <laughs> the true confessions are coming out now. Confessions. Anyways, I didn't hate it. You didn't hate it. So I didn't hate it. I didn't love it as much as the first one. But I still think there is a lot more ambiguity than what we're assuming. I agree with that. And you both are okay if they don't renew and they don't do a third season. Here's my thing. I would it would make me sad if they didn't, but I also know sometimes in the entertainment world that that's just the way the cookies crumble. I really would love these ladies to get back together. I really would like it to come to a, a solid cohesive end. But you're okay I, with the ending. As if, is. That's if it. this is the way the entire series ends. That's what I'm like, saying. This is it. This is the series finale. This is all we ever get. Is that a satisfying ending? That's what I'm saying. See, I fought I'm, square. I'm okay with it. Julian's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, am, I was going to say, I'm okay with it. Okay. Okay. I, I, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride <laughs> in the middle like I normally do. I see both sides because on the one hand, because I like a good meaty ending, because I like the continuity of the long form story, because I do think this one was done a little bit more deliberately as a setup for something more Mm -hmm. than the first one, which ended with did they or didn't they or will they or won't they? And there was really no guarantee that we would ever get that question. I agree Mm -hmm. on the one hand with Anna. I think that if they were going to end and be strong about the ending, the first season ending is the better ending of the two. However, I also in parts agree with Hillary and Julianne. I don't think it's necessarily, it's certainly not the way Eddie's describing it to me. <laughs> like, Anna's description's more exciting than the ending. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think they did a good job with the ending that they had, and there is enough, There, I think there is a red herring quality to it. That goes into the whole, I'm setting up for the season that may or may not happen. So Mm -hmm. on the one hand, I also agree with Hillary and Julianne. The the only problem is that, well, I don't know if there is a problem. A, I think it's not likely, but I think they're going to try. I think they're going to try for the third season. Nicole and Reese own the production company that is behind this, has the primary share in this show. HBO wants it. It's really just coordinating the schedules. And I think that... It's probably going to happen. I am thinking of. I think season. they'll make it happen. And I actually I think, think will that too. will be the. These last are powerful season. women. I mean, if they go, if they, I mean, in. I'm just saying, <laughs> these are like big name actors. It's not like freaking. <laughs> if they walk into a place and say, "Okay, we really want to make the," do you think that HBO is going to say no? Right, bro. 
That's true. That <laughs> it's is like true. Christmas Eve. I, just, I just have to be, I feel like I'm like Kylie right now, where I'm totally Switzerland, and like just watching this happen. I actually totally agree with Kylie's explanation on everything she just said. I, I thought it was like the perfect. Yeah. It was like a perfect summarization of all of our verbal diarrhea. Yeah, like, so, I'm not taking sides. Right. I'm just wondering what you think. <laughs> I definitely agree with Kylie. I <laughs> agree with Kylie the in that. <laughs> one at a time. One at a time. <laughs> you go. You go. <laughs> so, what I will say, though, is That's if Juliet. I had six seasons with these characters and this is how the season ended, I might be a little miffed about it. Okay. <laughs> Having oh, yeah. two seasons with them, I was kind of like, okay, okay. So, now that you, so now that you say that, I'm not happy with the ending. However, I don't think I could handle a season three. Only because, only, only because what else can we do with the whole Perry thing? They'll find a way. I don't necessarily think Perry is going to be the main thrust of the third season mm-hmm. at all. because They're, they're going to find a way. And I mm-hmm. think that there's enough husband fodder with the other husbands. Great. We're going to do a time jump and it's going to be about all the kids. I don't know about that either. But I will say... <laughs> I will say that if they make a third season, I would bet money it would be the last one, number one. And, yeah. and number two, I think the the goal of the hy- hypothetical, very hypothetical third season would be to tell the audience how these five women ride off into the sunset and if they even get that far. And whether or not... the mer- Because it, what the show kind of sets up in this end of the second season is that they all have their individual relationships and they've all worked so hard to deal with the fallouts of each of those individual relationships, regardless of what that is. But there's, there's a lot of psychological trauma. There's a lot of really unhealthy toxicity roaming through the marriages of pretty much every character all we of see. Them. Except oh, yeah. for Jane, mm-hmm. because she's not married. And even that relationship is very tenuous with her boyfriend because she's got her own traumas to deal with. Yep. I think what we're going to watch is how all of that converges into these five women becoming their own sort of family, which we see in season two quite a bit of. I think that's going to strengthen. And I think it's going to be how how they reclaim the lives that they have been all shaken up both by Perry's murder and by the various idiocies of their own choices or their spouse's choices in the case of Renata or whatever. I think that's what we're going to see. But I I don't think it will be more than one more season because I really don't know how they could squeeze this turn up any more than that. They can't. Yeah. I mean, they're all working on so much. They're very yeah, busy and too. famous and rich and beautiful and all that business. They they all and got talented. stuff. <laughs> so, but they also all loved this project and it was mm-hmm. a passion project for Nicole and Reese to develop the show and it was a passion project. I mean, it was very controversial because they were they were up for awards in the limited series or mini series category and then they ended up renewing in season two right around the time yeah. that those nominations happened so they had to reapply to be in regular categories and it was a whole thing and i just think it's because they had such a firm passion for the story and for the characters and we i think you've all elaborated as to why they're very complex they're very realistic they're very nuanced they're very layered there's a lot of different pieces of the spectrum that they can play with the individual characters that they've got and so i think to that end they all are sincere about the fact that they want to do it again it's just going to be and i'm pretty sure all the women on the show are in other shows written by the writers of like the main writers of the show i think you're thinking of that one on hulu which is called nine, nine, nine perfect strangers nine yes. perfect strangers but that's a mini series that's nine definitely perfect not strangers. strangers but isn't big sky is also written by them which Reese Witherspoon is on. Big Sky on called? ABC? Mm, Big Sky is so. David E. Kelly, but Reese Witherspoon isn't in it. That's Ryan Phillippe. <laughs> Awkward! <laughs> oh, rude! Mm. That's her Speaking ex. of ex-husband. Yeah. Speaking of ex-husband. I'm tired. The pills are kicking in. Everything comes full circle, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to say about season two before I ask you some of the wrap up catching up questions? I mean, I think if anything, people should still just enjoy it for the acting performances, but it is tough material to digest, yeah, digest and delve into. Yeah. That's so be good. ready for all that, but good disclaimer, Hillary. Good job. I didn't I even think I didn't even think about the disclaimers. <laughs> this is drama. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big so fat gonna, trigger warning. I got some three one. rapid fire questions. Are you ready, panel? Yes. Which yes. did you like better, season one or season two? Season, season one. one. Season one. That was unanimous. Season one. And I think we explained as to why. Should they make a season three, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. No. Yes, if just, to, if just to justify the ending of season two. Because honestly, I think if they make a season three, that I would, I could possibly, potentially eat my words about the ending of season two. Okay, Nicole and Reese, you heard it. We got to make Anna Laura eat them words. <laughs> start, start campaigning for Big Little Lies Season 3. Be like, I, we just want her to be wrong. I didn't answer. So what's your answer? I don't know. <laughs> it depends on what they do, right? Eddie said no. Know. Eddie yeah, said he no. said a straight, like, no. He was like, no. Said, no. no. Everybody else said yes. I'm going to say yes, because I really love those ladies. So I Okay, now that's horrible. Them. We're making it just on them. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's my only... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to laugh when season three comes and it's dope. Okay, what's the last question? <laughs> Eddie, why did you initially say... She's on, she's on rare form because she's got too much wine. Eddie! That all the wine, man. Right? Why did you say no initially but for Callie's, but the ladies? They're amazing actresses and their stories are so uh, that's powerful. That's what I said! When, yeah, but you said no for the question. I'm just reinforcing what you're saying. Oh, but why I'm did you? Oh, you're agreeing with me. I thought you were yes. like disagreeing with me. Oh, okay. No. Okay, we're good. Kelly's okay. like, I'm ready. Throw down challenge. <laughs> Okay, I am totally not the only one that's had too much wine. Okay. I love you, Eddie. Love Continue you to agree with me. Okay. But what I asked was, Eddie, why did you... Oh, you look like it's going to get too out of hand. Yeah. Why did you initially oh, say no? I, I just think it's, it's they've done so much good that I just feel like it's going to turn into a show that's just... It's going to be hard to watch. It's going to like be don't easy. overstay your welcome. Pretty much, and it's going to turn into a show that I probably would only watch it because of the podcast. Because we're going to podcast about it, and I would be afraid I'm going to jump shark like real quick because the story is just going to get drawn out so quick and so fast. But based on the women that are in the show, the performances. I feel like a lot of the main characters in the show could have their own little spinoffs, and I would watch it. I would watch a spinoff of Celeste, like, tomorrow. But all of their stories combined and why they're together, I just feel like it's already been been drawn out in season two. Why mess up something that's good? Why, Why ruin something that's good as it is that's why i initially said no fair enough i would like them to make a season three because i do feel a little more pull towards the season is the the season two felt a little incomplete as opposed to ambiguous i think that's a, a good way of describing it i agree with anna about that not as with as much vitriol as you though lady i mean you've got <laughs> things i i don't feel it that strongly i'm much more listen the, all I heard is you agreeing with me. Uh huh. I know. <laughs> I will take it. I will take it. Okay. All I've taken from this recording is that you agree with me and I'm right, and <laughs> also that I'm a very empathetic and good person. So... I'm so glad that you succeeded. Your first takeaway with that. I was going to say, you know, no. I'm starting to see some of that juxtaposition you were talking about. <laughs> Maybe you're not dripping. I don't know. You're a mystery. Let's do season three about Anna Laura. <laughs> Looks like you're the a- characters in this 
this show, I am complicated. You're I'm a mystery what? wrapped up in an enigma. <laughs> Where the hell did Kelly go? I don't know. To, um, to church? I don't know. What's going on here? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> they suddenly there's Jesus on the wall. <laughs> Amen. Really? Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. All right, so the final question is the question I must always ask at the end of a, one of our episodes. That's all I recommend it. Would you recommend Big Little Lies <laughs> after the second season? Why or why not, Hillary? Yes. yes. I'm going to say as far as... Yes, and I'm going to say as far as sophomore seasons go, there may be some things to, you know, maybe not the same level of story quality because they were making their own story past the original source material. But even still, as far as those things go, it still holds up pretty well. And again, as I said earlier, just for the acting alone, it is worth a watch. It's a short season. It's a fairly quick watch. I mean, with all the other stuff that people binge watch, I don't see why this couldn't be part of that. So... I 100% agree with all of that. Why there's no good reason not to watch this show. I feel like I the, agree. Acting, the acting's too too good. The storylines are powerful. It's relatable and I I agree it's easy to watch. I mean, I did it while watching while I watched it while doing cardio. 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Boom. There you go. Knocked it out. Boom. Yeah. I would also say, like, you know, we all kind of had some problems with season two, but I think a lot of us would agree season two is better than a lot of seasons from a lot of shows. You know what I mean? I, true. I would agree with that. So true. <laughs> yeah. True. So true. Yeah. Just because it's not as good as season one doesn't mean it's bad. Right. Correct. Correct. It's just bad. It just didn't follow the quality of their season. Yeah, still so, better than Frozen and Once Upon a Time. That's all I'm gonna say. I have another analog, a similar, not a similar show, but a similar setup. Thirteen Reasons Why, first season, directly based upon the book. Mm. Pretty good. I mean, if you like that sort of thing. Second season, based on their own script writing ideas from whatever they were trying to do from the first season. Train wreck, and then it kept going for two more seasons. So, and I jumped. Yeah, and I was one of the people who could not get through. I the additional seasons. The I thing. watched thirteen reasons why initially, completely compelled, but was so appalled. Man, I wish I had one of Spencer's freaking like metaphors right now. I I could not watch it. I, I watched not. the first three episodes and jumped because of season two of season two right no of the whole thing because it it was disgusting to me the whole idea of somebody blaming in letters somebody else's suicide or whatever is disgusting it's disgusting the whole premise of it is disgusting and i jumped i've but. never even tried to watch it i you know no. a friend whose opinion i trust told me what was going on with it and i was like mm, no miss me and so the controversy of that lives on but nevertheless sure i agree with kylie's <laughs> set to like the comparison she yeah, was the trying comparison stands. The source material was there for the first season, not for the second. And the second season for that one was just so abysmal. And, and just uh, uh, outside of the concept, mm-hmm. we're just talking strictly writing. Correct. Sure. The writing took a huge snow dive. And that's Uh-oh. what that's what Kylie, I think, was... And I completely agree with that. Whereas here, it does not. It's, it maintains... Mm-hmm. A very high caliber of quality writing. There might be some missteps. There might be a little bit of messiness. In some ways, that comes from the fact that it is a very dramatic story, but also because they don't have the, a source to draw upon. But they still mm-hmm. did it far more effectively and far more compelling a way than a similar type of situation with that other show. Yeah, also, totally if you agree. care to listen like about our panel's very like, bad so, opinions oh. about 13 Reasons Why... Head on over to couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, our YouTube channel. Some of it's still in our audio feed. We did cover that show. There was a huge mass exodus of shark jumping, and I cover that pretty thoroughly. Julianne, you were saying. Oh, well, I, well, I was going to say, you know, sometimes second seasons of shows in general are sort of challenging if 
there's not sort of like a completed story arc idea like one of the shows one of the panels that we were on together kylie was mr robot and yeah. like we had a lot to say about that second season but it's really relevant in the course of the entire story of yes, the series exactly. whereas like we don't really have that with this one so everything that gets tacked on to it sort of feels like bonus season in a way so i think like I don't know if that makes sense, but like there are shows that like it's like an entire yeah it's an entire arc. Like it's sometimes like I would never with a show like Mr. Robot, I would never say just watch a couple seasons. I would say watch the entire thing because it is a journey that everybody goes on, and it's really evident that it was intentional, like from the beginning to the end, that there was like th there was something here. Whereas like we don't really have that with this right so i feel like in a way it makes it kind of hard to hard to judge or maybe like we i don't know maybe judging it harsher is the right thing to do just because of that because this is all like extra content you know they didn't yeah, it's more like an epilogue yes yeah. yeah i agree with that yeah that's a nice way to look at yeah, it that's a way to think about it mm -hmm. i like that but everybody would recommend it is what i heard yeah Correct. all right yeah. thumbs up seven up so at this point, since I think we've told a lot of truths, big and little, haha, -ha, about the big little lies, is there anything else that you want to say about either of these seasons or what you hope to see in a season three of Big Little Lies? I feel like we covered it pretty well. I agree. <laughs> I also agree. What a wonderful panel this is, so full of vivaciousness and wine <laughs> and, and opinions about big little lies and so to that end what i'd like to do at this time is thank hillary and anna laura and julianne and kelly and eddie for joining me once again to catch up on big little lies we are officially caught up but we can't get too far without at least rolling some credits couch potatoes unite exclamation point was produced by back pocket productions run by yours truly the chief couch potato which is really another way of saying executively produced by me kylie piet my associate producers are krista pennington and celine resmer i edit this podcast and our logo is by rebecca wallace our marketing graphic artist is krista our theme song was written by sarah milbratz and sung by sarah amy mcdaniel and kaus resmer Kaus played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole shebang was engineered by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. We hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us, give us stars, provide comments, or review us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, and Amazon are just a few of the places you can find us, but we're also on YouTube. We have our website. Otherwise, feel free to tell us how we're doing, what we should add, subtract, keep, or toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions for shows we might consider, contact us at our website where we have a guest book, by email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, our Facebook, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or wherever you get your podcasts. Though, of course, we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time and always have new episodes coming down the pipe. Just listen to our intros. If you miss old episodes or want to know in general what shows we cover, just search for us. Find us wherever you do searchable things on the Internet. Don't forget that exclamation point or contact us via our website, our email, our social media accounts, and stay up on all the new events and episodes by our humble little podcast, Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point! Until the next time, all available seasons of Big Little Lies are available to stream on HBO or HBO Max, depending upon what you have. In the meantime, it is unclear when our Big Little Lies panel might next reconvene, as we've discussed, because it's unclear if Big Little Lies will be renewed. It hasn't actually been canceled yet either. So we're just going to kind of stay on top of it, make sure that you know what's going on, make sure we know what's going on, and we'll keep you apprised of all the news as it relates to the series. If there is a season three, our panel will reconvene following the finale or the release of that season to discuss it. So until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned! Bye-bye! See you later.